I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Dr. Baker, would you like to start us off with your opening comment this evening? Thank you, Madam Chair, and ladies and gentlemen of the board um, and my, my executive team, the cabinet. I want to thank you for um, uh, making sure that we had this opportunity to uh, come together today to, to look into where we are with the FY19 budget development and adoption process, I, I wanted to start out by, again, thanking uh, a number of different uh, folks that are both here and those that have, from my perspective, been um, keen contributors to uh, where we find ourselves today. Uh, first, I, I want to thank the cabinet group that is in front of you, as well as the, the many staff that are both in the audience and who have supported the development, um, the adjustments, as well as ultimately the execution and making sure that uh, what we uh, have to utilize is, is maximized in terms of the budget process. I want to thank all of our staff. We have many different advisories, from teacher advisory to uh, parent advisories to student advisories, all ha who, have wit have, who have helped to inform uh, where we are today, uh, inform and inspire where we are today by providing input and feedback. And lastly, I want to uh, thank this board for uh, your tremendous support over the last few months, um, your determination in, in making sure that our staff have what they need and our schools have what they need in order to ultimately provide our students with what they need. Uh, tonight, we, we find ourselves in, uh, at least in the, the time that I have had the uh, honor to, to serve as superintendent here find ourselves in a um, much stronger fiscal position than we usually are at this time of year. And um, that is largely due to uh, the funding support that we have received most recently from our County Board of Supervisors and County Government. Um, I want to thank them for their support in making sure that we are able to fund uh, the, the number one and two priorities that, that really made up this budget. We say frequently that uh, our business is a people business, and this is all about making sure that the people that we have who do the good work, who are dedicated and loyal to the cause and to our school division and our students are um, provided the, the support they need through increases in compensation in this case supported by the recent pay study and uh, also adjusted uh, in terms of the solutions to, to maximize what we're able to put towards that compensation proposal. Uh, secondly, uh, to be able to add human resources and target those resources, uh, again, people uh, helping our students uh, within the schools. And uh, tonight we'll, we'll go over both of those number one and two uh, goals and priorities for this, this budget. But I do want to provide a, a couple of um, reminders as we go through. Uh, first, uh, tonight you're going to see a, a potential adjustment, uh, not a, a negative adjustment, uh, not a major adjustment, but an adjustment just the same that we offer as a, as a recommendation for the board to consider uh, relative to the original compensation proposal. And this adjustment would enable um, let me back up. First of all, the reason that this option is possible is for two reasons. One, uh, we have received the majority of the funding we need to close the gap. So again, I, I, I thank the, the folks that are responsible for that. Second, our staff, I want to thank Ms. Gaines, uh, Mr. Treyer, their whole staff for uh, working with human resources to analyze um, person by person. Uh, we had estimates that we worked with from the Evergreen study, but uh, over the last couple of months and 
they are close to, to completing that, they have been able to go one by one to determine exactly from a payroll perspective what the impact of each of the recommendations uh, would be. As a result, um, and Ms. Gaines will explain it a little bit more later, we believe that it is possible with relatively the same amount uh, that has been recommended to go towards compensation that we can provide uh, a minimum 4% pay increase for all support staff with the exception of those who are on administrative scales, which would mean in this year, which would be, a, I think, something that a few years ago would not have been imagined, um, but to be able to provide uh, a 4 percent pay increase at a minimum to almost all of our employees, again, with the exception of our administrators, but they would also re still receive a 2 percent pay increase. So that is something to come in a little more detail. Um, also, I wanted to remind you that in March, uh, again, to uh, be responsive to what many in our community were concerned about, as we all were, is uh, uh, we had a, a presentation that provided uh, greater insight into how we currently work to keep our schools safe and secure. And in that process, uh, you may remember that Mr. Upperco and his staff did reference that in our current capital improvement plan, we still have just a handful of uh, entrances that we are still working to create better security for. Um, we are going to be able to adjust the timing of all those entrances that are still left to have them completed during the 2018-19 school year. Uh, it will not increase our debt service and we are able to do it uh, within the existing allocations. Um, so finally, I think that tonight uh, our staff will share how we are able to close the very small uh, gap that at this point, based on projections, as you know, we still do not have an approved state budget, but based on those projections where we are in terms of the small amount of, of funding that we will need to find uh, in or make adjustments in order to for you to be able to balance the budget. So again, Thank you, uh, and appreciate the board's uh, work moving forward. Thank you. I just want to start by saying, as we're getting nearer to the end of this budget season, this is definitely one of the best financial situations that we've been in since I've been a board member, and I'm, I'm very excited to see a budget that was approved by this board that really prioritized staff, schools, and the students. Um, I want to thank Dr. Baker and cabinet and staff and the fellow board members that supported the budget as well as the Board of Supervisors that, that helped um, agree with our priorities. Um, this approved budget definitely prioritized the increase in compensation and human resources, while it also puts safety at the forefront, especially towards the end of this budget season, and we ac achieved some fantastic goals in safety-oriented places that we had only hoped to accomplish before. Um, I also want to thank the, f the school board members that worked so hard to help support this budget and Dr. Baker for the last couple months and helped get it to this point. Um, with that, I, we were like to hear about those lovely option of closing the gap. <laughs> Mrs. Gaines, if you can start with 7.01 FY19 revenue updates. Thank you, Chair Lady Graham, school board members, Dr. Baker and Dr. Martin. What we want to do first is to review with you uh, revenue changes. So I will draw your attention to slide number five. And when you look here, you'll basically see the adopted budget from the locality of 124 million. When you look here at the adjustments, you'll basically see we did have one-time funds of 333,000. When Dr. Baker approved his budget and presented that budget along with the school board, he did include a debt service increase of about 1.5 million when the county administrator presented on February the 13th, that did include an increase of 1.5. So the last time we met, your gap was 2 million. Based on action taken by the Board of Supervisors on April the 12th, they did increase the appropriation by about 1.8 million. Keep in mind, this amount does include 
one-time funding of 250000 Therefore, you're looking at a net increase of 4.4 from the county. So that is your local revenue increase. Now, by way of next steps for the locality, once you approve your budget, staff will reconcile with county staff. Then the supervisors in the month of May will look to appropriate the budget. So that is the local budget changes. The next one that you'll see will be on page six. Here you're basically looking at the state revenue and when looking at the state revenue, you can basically see, um, based on our projections, this is based on the governor's budget. When we did have the initial crossover coming from the Senate, we would lose about $40,000. $40, coming from the House, we would gain $150,000. At this point, we do know that the General Assembly is now in special session, and that could take a week or two. So right now, we still are awaiting a final budget from the state. Nevertheless, based on what we know today, that projected increase from the state is basically $7.4 million, really $7.5 million. So with that, when you look at where we will be for FY20, we look to receive an additional increase of about 1.3. So that is the state budget um, in that regard. When you look at page seven, you're basically looking at your federal revenues, and federal revenues basically make up 5% of our budget. And for the most part, you're looking at Title I funds, Title VI B funds, et cetera. And those, for the most part, have stayed pretty level. So that brings you to where we are with the gap. Um, when you look at the gap, it was $2 million based on additional funding provided by the Board of Supervisors. We're looking at a gap of 250000 so a couple points we want to point out here. Number one, staff is recommending by way of closing the gap, we would look at one time, um, we would look at non-compensation items that are in the budget currently. So by taking those items and eliminating those and paying with those through year and funds or carryover, that will bring your gap down to zero. Also keep in mind the one Point eight million from the county does include one-time funding of 250000 What we would do there, too, would be to take non-comp funding that is normally reoccurring, and we would apply that to those funds. So this probably is the most important slide that's before you this evening. So that is slide number eight. Then it brings you to the compensation proposal options. So a couple things we want to highlight. Number one, when you looked at your budget, your number one goal was to provide pay increases. We did follow a similar pattern as the county. Um, they did look at the composite, the CPI, consumer price index of 2.1. For the teachers, a 4% increase. For staff at that time, other staff, 2%. Also looking at the Evergreen study, bring to minimum in one year, and the Evergreen classification over three-year period. That brought us up to 967000 So the total compensation proposal, based on the last time we met, was 6.8. Now let's look at the next slide. This is another option that the board can consider. So number one, when you look at where we are, teachers still at a 4% pay increase, you're looking at 4.8. When we begin to scrub the numbers, a, a couple uh, factors you want to look at. Number one, the Evergreen study was done in 2017. We're now looking at a budget of 2019. So two years later, in looking at the Evergreen study of 494 people, 75 of those individuals are no longer with the school division. Makes sense? Basic turnover. Number two, you basically have about 60 individuals that are no longer eligible for the increase because when we work with Evergreen to scrub the numbers again, we had to look at higher dates. Based on those higher dates, they were no longer eligible. So when you look at those different factors, we were able to see that the cost of the Evergreen 
proposal was about 500,000. Knowing that, we began to say, what are some other options? So we scrubbed the numbers even more. We are in a position tonight to give all employees, except for administrators, a total 4% increase. So when we analyze all the numbers line by line, once everyone received a 4% increase, if they still had not reached whatever Green recommended that they be at, they still received the additional amount up to that. Once those numbers were completed, the total cost of the Evergreen, including the 2%, was about a million. So we're able to achieve this with an additional $57,000. So we wanted to share that with you. And um, at this time, if you have any questions, one way that you can consider looking at that 57,000 additional amount of funds, looking at where we are with ADM, Right now, based on our March 31st ADM, we're looking at students of 23,174. We are projecting for next year's budget 23,175. But we do know students do come and they do go. Staff would feel very comfortable increasing that ADM number by about 11 students and that will cover the $57,000. So based on the additional analysis that has been completed, we thought it would be useful to provide you with what would be the average percent increase by employee category. So the first category that you see here, number one, would be administrators, 2%. When looking at your bus aides, you're looking at 9%, primarily because of the evergreen, bring the minimum. Bus drivers, 4%. Your cafe managers and workers, 6%. Your clerical staff, 4%. Same thing with your custodians. Your maintenance workers, your nurses, paraeducators, 6%. Teachers, we talked about the 4%. When you look at your ITAs, you're looking at 8%. And then other technology staff, 4%. So we did want to provide you with that level of detail. Now, what are some of the benefits of the 4% um, if the school board would be interested in moving in that direction? Number one, it provides majority of the employees with a minimum of a 4% increase. Also, it provides employees with additional VRS benefits through a salary increase, which is payable for a lifetime. Most importantly, it does increase the offset of the health insurance increases. So we thought that was very important. And then also we've taken the same approach as the county, the uh, three-step approach. So at this time, are there any questions you want to ask staff regarding um, the initial proposal or even the revised proposal? Ms. Gaines, I want to thank you for the work that you and your staff put in uh, to brief us and prepare us for uh, making this uh, decision. Um, I, on slide uh, 12 or page 12, uh, we have a listing by categories of an increase uh, by each particular occupation. Is these, are these numbers assuming that we adopt a 4% uh, or the uh, course of action that you stated that we needed $57,000 for. Yes, sir. So that's what th th these numbers are assuming. Yes, okay. sir. And um, let me see if I had another question. I just wanted to. No, I had no other questions. Thank you. Dr. Meyer. And Mrs. Gaines, then would we also not assume that we could add 11 students on our ADM figure, our March 31st calculated figure that would give us the revenue to offset the 57,000. Yes, sir, we could. We would feel very comfortable doing so. Thank you. Mr. Twig. I'd just like to point out that from our original uh, superintendent's proposal, we uh, were offering 4% uh, uh, for teachers and 2% for all other staff that incorporated the uh, 
$5 million uh, 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 gap that we had at that time. Uh, and uh, I just want to note that uh, just in case uh, supervisors have any qualms about that issue. But uh, having heard what you stated, uh, I got to believe that we could uh, support that uh, equitably and uh, move forward and, uh, and uh, get th those other uh, uh, staff uh, uh, out of the red and into the black after the insurance adjustment uh, from their 2% pay raise. Now it's 4%. I think that too will be equitably equitable for everybody. And uh, uh, I'm excited about that opportunity. Great. Thank you for the, uh, the data. I'd like also just to, as a follow-up to that, I, I want to make sure that it's clear, and I, I think it is, um, but I, I want to restate that what was presented to the county in terms of the uh, breakdown of the gap, particularly as it relates to the estimates for the compensation proposal, are relatively unchanged. This is really uh, a revised recommendation for how to direct the very funding that we were requesting. It has not changed the ultimate substance of it. But I think also even from the feedback that, that we have received from many, uh, it all ultimately comes down to with what has been provided um, based on the request, what is the best thing to do uh, for our employees, both, both in the short term and the long term. And we do not anticipate uh, as the last two years, this board has made adjustments in the modernization of our health insurance um, to provide savings. Uh, we do not anticipate that type of adjustment in terms of increased rates in the coming years. So for this particular year, we think it does help, especially some employees, to better offset. Uh, and again, it will be dependent upon what plan they are on in their situation, but we do believe that it will be in the best interest of our employees uh, moving forward. Any further questions on the compensation aspect of this? Mrs. Gaines, you may continue. So if we move on now to the five-year health insurance modernization plan, um, as you know, in working with uh, both finance and HR, we've been working with the employee compensation focus group that Dr. Baker created almost three years ago. Also, um, at Dr. Baker's um, request, um, HR and finance have conducted so far two of the four health insurance education sessions. And you can basically see here on the screen um, what the topics have been. Uh, in terms of premium changes, plan design changes. We did share with them the five-year health insurance plan. We talked about some scenarios and open enrollment. One of the questions that we did receive um, in sharing this information was, could any consideration be provided to also provide support staff with a 4% uh, pay raise? Um, so that is something that we did crunch the numbers for and we have presented this evening. We do have another session coming up April 26 at Riverbend at 430. And we're going to do a special session for the transportation personnel on April 27th. Um, as indicated over the last two years in working with the Employee Compensation Focus Group, we have saved a cumulative of $3.6 million. And these funds have been rerouted for other budget priorities. That brings us to goal number two, as presented in Dr. Baker's budget, um, basically resources to support student success. Um, the school board is already very familiar uh, with these 60 positions and where they're located. So what we're attempting to do is just to provide you with a summary here on page 19. And then you will see on page 20 a more detailed itemization um, broken down by the cost as well. And this is fully loaded with salaries and benefits. Um, the good news, um, based on where we are today, um, the principals and HR is very excited to get out and start the recruiting process so that we can have everyone on board. So that is on page 20. Next, page 22. This will take you to the department request. Uh, keep in mind um, here, which is line number one, instruction non-comp. This is where we're uh, 
recommending to you this evening for consideration is that with that gap of 250,000 that we would reduce uh, 300 250,000 of the 354 that you see here these are non comp items um, you only have three options with a budget our size 85 percent being salaries and benefits it either would be positions to resolve the gap it would be programs or non comp and this evening staff is recommending non comp so again, you can see a listing of these various uh, positions um, in terms of what staff have requested. When you look at page 23, these are primarily our programs. Um, these are uh, what were included in your school board approved budget, so you're very familiar with these. Also for your CIP for FY19, you can see that that number is 30.8 million at the bottom. That brings us to next steps um, in terms of based on information shared this evening, um, does the board feel that an additional budget work session is needed? Um, after that, what staff would do um, would work with you to have your budget adopted. So then we'll be working with the county to reconcile the numbers and then the supervisors will appropriate the funds. And then um, once we have an approval of the budget, we would be able to move very quickly and begin to work on our contracts and release those, recognizing that we do have a very short summer. So as soon as we can get started, the better. And then with the positions that you saw this evening, recruiting and hiring those new staff. Ms. Shelley. Thank you. Thank you for all the details. This was wonderful. Um, I do have a question about the health insurance meetings. Sure. Have they been well attended? So the first meeting, you know, we're you math people. We love numbers. So we did our count, Ms. Shelley. So our first meeting, we had uh, 42. Our next meeting, um, we did have 26. So we would like to say that they were well attended. Also, Ms. Colbert, what she did do, she did provide the presentation in advance. And based on that, we have many individuals who have reviewed that. And they've called in with some questions. And um, that was an excellent idea, excellent idea. So kudos to our superintendent. Thank you. And then will after all of them, well, they, you said they had the they had the presentation, so never mind that that question is null and void. Um, I think that was it. Um, I like everything I'm seeing here. I really like everything I'm seeing here. I really like that four percent for everyone. We had discussed. I like that. I'm so glad that we were able to do that. Um, and with the ADM because I know last year we ended with a low ADM but yet we started the year with a lot more how many more students did we start the year it was like 222 that's what I was thinking so if we have an ADM of over 19 we could start the year again with another 200 more students wow but something like that could easily happen um, so I I, I um, like what staff is doing with that dr. Baker that was good thinking. Thanks. Dr. Meyer. On page 22, your first item on in, in non-conference instruction, are we really reducing or are we deferring it? Because if you're using year end, you'd, we would be able to restore it. Correct. So what we're actually doing, we're deferring it. And um, that is the answer. It's a, a deferment. Because Thank those you. items are still items that we need. Correct. OK. That's uh, why I, I wanted the clarification, because I heard reduce, and that's different. And I, I think the, the board will probably be familiar that the, um, you know, the ugly truth of it is that every year uh, for the past few budget cycles, instruction has, um, you know, put in request to uh, have what we would like to be recurring lines in certain um, areas of non-comp instruction, particularly in areas such as assessment solutions or um, textbooks or any, any number of things. We have continued to function year to year with one-time funds and have been able to to put that together and, and in many cases it can serve that purpose because they may be slightly different items each year but we have become accustomed to managing that through carryover and then again the one-time funding that has been uh, allocated to us by the board of supervisors does enable us to not be cut too short in those areas so can thank our instruction folks for their continued resourcefulness Madam Chair, um, 
you went over, Mrs. Cage, you went over the revenues, and you mentioned the Senate version and the House version. That's what they're deliberating this week, correct? Yes, that is correct. So when you look at the budget that you see this evening, it is based on the governor's budget. When they did have crossover back in uh, February, um, when we did the, when Mr. Trayer looked at the numbers, we would lose 40000 from the state, but we would gain from the House. So I did make contact with the Assistant Superintendent of Finance from VDOE today, indicating um, does he have any predictions of when they would be able to close out. And all he was really able to share is that currently they are starting the special session this week and they will continue their process. And he also did share that um, once they have completed their work, it takes them about 10 days, even before they can give us the state template. So at the earliest, we may be looking to receive something around May. Okay, with that, uh, Madam Chair, I really don't see the need for us to have an additional work session on the 30th um, because whatever comes forth out of the action of the General Assembly um, would be able to be incorporated later through a budget amendment mm -hmm. uh, because it's going to be strictly state funds. That's right. exactly. And it could easily handle what was deferred mm -hmm. of the non-comp mm -hmm. or even address other needs. So with that, I think the first item would be, I don't see the need for an additional work session. Uh, the second item is, I think it would behoove us as a board to adopt the budget this evening with the recommended changes for the reason that we know that as soon as staff can begin the hiring process, we, we would be losing at least 30 days before they could hit it again. And I'd like to see staff with the ability to be able to contract those people now rather than wait and then bring it to us in 30 days. Because I know also the preparation for contracts takes extensive amount of work. And the sooner we can put those contracts in the hands of our teachers and support staff, the sooner staff will know where we are on available positions and then we'd be able to start filling those positions. So. Uh, I think there's two points to my thinking. One, I don't see the budget session, additional budget session as being necessary. And two, I don't see any reason why we couldn't adopt the budget this evening. And if, if you wish, I'll make that motion to that effect. I think we have some other closing comments and then uh, we can come back to your motion, Dr. Myers. Are you okay with that? Mrs. Phelps, do you have anything to comment? Yeah, I do. Thank you so much for um, crunching the numbers. Uh, my concern was the um, negative net pay impact to uh, the staff. And, and, uh, and I see right here through what you just presented to us um, that that would help out. And, uh, and so I feel good about it. I, I, I do. And I appreciate everything um, that you guys put into it to crunch the numbers and you know, help the staff out and the employees that I heard from. And, um, and I'm really grateful for it. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, I, so that's all I have to say. But thank you for your hard work, everybody. Thanks. Mr. Baswell. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, first of all, I, wanna, I concur with uh, uh, Dr. Meyer's assessment for the need of having another uh, budget work session. I don't believe that it's necessary and that uh, I would be in support of uh, adopting the budget uh, this evening. Um, I, I wanted to uh, thank, again, staff for the hard work, especially in the area of health insurance. Health insurance is a personal uh, thing. It's uh, people get really attached uh, to their health insurance and they're leery of making adjustments and changes to their health insurance. And we need to continue, as you've already started, uh, impressing upon our uh, uh, employees that we have to uh, make adjustments in the way we do business. We can't do business in the same way we used to. That there are more innovative products that are going to be presented in the future and that they have to 
be very open-minded about receiving these innovative products because they're not only beneficial for the division, but they're actually very beneficial for them. They just have to make sure that they have an open mind to receive uh, the benefits or to listen to the benefits so that both sides can win. So I just want to say that about health insurance. I recognize it's a very difficult thing to do, that you have to keep plugging away at it, and we need to keep saying from the dais and from wherever else we can um, that uh, having or maintaining obsolete health insurance uh, is not beneficial to anyone. So I just want to sh thank you for that. I am so delighted and excited uh, that we can actually say goodbye to the activity fee. Uh, it's something that has been a crawl in my side, uh, and I'm so excited that that's going to go away. Young people should not have any barriers in participating in extracurricular activities in our school system. And so I'm really excited that even though it took time, we managed to do it incrementally, but we finally sunset uh, the activity fees, and I'm thankful for that. But I'm also concerned, though, that uh, the athletic fees, the things, uh, the coaches, young coaches that spend time with our students, we are still 10 years behind. Even though we got them caught up to the cuts, the 20% cuts that were going on during the depression, uh, or I mean the recession, uh, we're still 10 years behind, and we need to continuously push for increases in activity. Uh, stipends for our coaches. Um, they pl play a major role in our ability to educate young people. And the athletic fields, the uh, theater and other activities that uh, we pay stipends for uh, really enhance the learning. It is truly the laboratory of what we actually do. And so I, uh, I want us to be mindful of the coaching stipends in the future that because we got back to a point where we uh, made our original cuts, it's not the end of the story. I'm excited about sub rates increases. We have to maintain competitive sub rates, not just because we want to be able to replace uh, teachers that uh, go out um, uh, you know, or need to have someone uh, fill in for them in class. Uh, sub rates and having great subs in the school are an excellent recruiting tool. Uh, we get an opportunity to uh, see uh, firsthand uh, some of the teachers that we may, or not necessarily just teachers, but others that we want to have working with our children uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And we get to audition them. Uh, and we get the very best and brightest because our rates are competitive and they want to come and work at Spotsylvania County Schools. So I'm really excited about all of these things, and I'm really excited about the fact that we can offer to all of our employees a 4% increase. Uh, I am emphatic about the fact that we need to have teacher pay at a point where we are very competitive in the region because it's, it's a supply and demand game. And we need to make sure that we offer the very uh, competitive uh, packages to make our recruiting uh, uh, much more efficient and effective uh, for Spotsylvania County Schools. Uh, Madam Chair, I conclude my comments. Mr. Tobig, do you have some closing comments? Uh, are we going to talk about CIP funds here in a few minutes? For sure. We had an update in Dr. Baker's open yeah. um, statement. I'll, I'll restate that, but we'll certainly answer any questions that, okay. that you may have relative to the, the CIP plan. But uh, what the board had approved back in um, January is relatively the, the exact same CIP that we would be moving forward with, with the exception of the, um, we had a, a handful of entrances that were uh, scheduled based on their complexity, not just their cost for years other than FY19. We have, um, based on a lot of things coming together, including the, um, the tools that help support those entrances uh, with new cameras and uh, voice over IP, several things that are connected on all fronts. Um, I have uh, urged our folks, and they've been very receptive, uh, 
and I appreciate that. But they also want to um, work on getting all of those entrances completed during the course of the 2018-19 uh, school year. So those will be moved up to that year if they are in another year. And uh, r rather than specify them out, I just want to give that generally. And so based on other projects that uh, are still, I guess, carryover funds, we can do that without any increase in our debt service. Okay, th uh, thank you for that explanation. Uh, uh, that's one of two issues that I have had with our uh, initial budget. Uh, one is is that those entrances had to be moved up to the front of the, the CIP line before we spend dollar one on everything else. And it sounds like we're aggressively pushing that direction. And I appreciate that, uh, Dr. Baker, uh, for you to push that and uh, working with this, our good staff to uh, to uh, make that happen. And we'll all be looking forward to that. And uh, I'm sure we'll be able to have a, a, a strong success rate uh, uh, to discuss a year from now. Uh, the other thing is the... Uh, uh, pay raise for some of our service personnel will put them in the negative and uh, it, it encourages me that uh, uh, with uh, little adjustment we're able to put everybody in the positive all of our, our entire staff uh, and uh, those are my were my two big concerns and I appreciate again everybody's efforts to uh, help us push that into po into the positive and uh, again under Dr. Baker's leadership. Thank you. Mr. Blaine. A couple of brief uh, comments. Uh, this is the seventh year on our board here and I think this is the best uh, without any question contract that we're able to agree to and to pass and it gives me a lot of pleasure to be able to to say that. Um, The comments that are, have been made by all of my colleagues are right on, but this enables us, and I think what we see is the growth that has been possible in our division. We're giving more kids more opportunities all the time. Our children have more choice in this, this public school system. We are now offering, as you know, our international baccalaureate program. There's a terrific uh, dynamism in the current tech center and Keith Wolf has been pushing that. We're going to see increased opportunities for our children there, giving them more choice again. Uh, there are about 86,000 jobs available today in the state of Virginia that are unfillable because we do not have students trained and that's what our CTE is working at. And we're all, this kind of a budget enables that to take place and our, our, our management team frankly is, is looking ahead when you see us able to put and I, I really can't include myself and us there but our, our professional staff has done an outstanding job in assembling and figuring out how to allocate these funds as a result I too happen to agree there's no need for an additional meeting and I think that uh, we ought to vote on this this evening thank you just want to say that I agree with that. I just want to sum up the budget that we were able to accomplish before we vote on it. Um, we were, this uh, revised changes emphasizes security in this, with the CIP changes. We were able to give all employees a 4% increase, 2% increase for admin. We were able to get the 28 instruction contracted positions, 24 special education positions, eight technology ITAs, which we know we've needed. Um, some of those contract positions are therapists and school psychologists and those things that can help us with the mental health ep epidemic we're facing. Um, this budget was actually able to do a lot of things and counting on a, f a, a couple more ADM to fund it, I think it's pretty easy. And this year though, when we get that shocking number of 200 increase in enrollment, we'll be prepared because we have some extra staff that we've planned for. Where last year we had cut staff to make the budget work and we're faced with an extra 220 
upon enrollment. So that was a very tough thing to deal with. We dealt with that this year. This year we're able to be ahead of the curve. So I really think that is a wonderful improvement. Um, I think that we need to keep encouraging employees to go to our health insurance seminars um, to make sure that they're on the best plan for them to make them sure they're getting the most out of their pay raises. And I just, as Baron said, happy to eliminate <laughs> that activity fee and always happy to increase the sub rates because we have to stay competitive. And we, we're definitely we're able to include the activity bus pilot expansion, which is near and dear to my rural district. And I'm happy about that. And I'm still thrilled that we were able to uh, really provide for our in-house custodian transition that I'm happy that we have done. So um, with that summary, I think Dr. Meyer wanted the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. And if uh, someone would second the motion and we could have a roll call vote, we can move on with adopting the budget. Motion by Dr. Meyer to adopt the budget that was previously adopted with these modifications. I will second that. Second by Mr. Blaine and Ms. Shelley. <laughs> Roll call by <laughs> starting with Ms. Shelley. Shelley, aye. Meyer, aye. Phelps, aye. Braswell, aye. Twig, aye. Blaine, aye. Gramp, aye. Congratulations. We need to compliment you as well. Yeah, thank you, staff. Ms. May I say? Ms. Shelley. Well, thank you, staff. Thank you, Dr. Baker. Thank you, board. Um, and thank you, everybody that's helped with this. But I have a question about now. Now that we have adopted the budget, when are we going to start posting and um, recruiting for all these wonderful positions right now? <laughs> Probably soon. Yeah, this week we will begin to uh, to post some positions. Uh, some of those positions, as you may know, we are trying to move away from contracted services uh, to save cost. Uh, so that speaks to, as we know in our teacher area, there are shortages in many of those areas. So we do want to be aggressive in, in getting the word out and recruiting for those positions uh, right away. Budget is complete, so we will now be moving on to item number eight, our Head Start training for our school board members. But I don't think she's here yet, so we might need to be in a recess. We will recess until Ms. Miller joins us for our Head Start training. All those in favor? Aye. Motion carries 7-0. So Motion by Mr. Braswell, second. second by Mrs. Phelps. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. We are now in open session. So that brings us to item number eight, Head Start Training for School Board Members. Mrs. Miller. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Dawn Miller. I'm the coordinator for Head Start. I also work very closely with Michael Mudd and the Virginia Preschool Initiative Program, which we call VPI. So I'm here this evening to fulfill one of our um, performance standards from the um, government. We are federally funded and um, we have, we operate through pro pro program performance standards. The government likes to make sure that we are reminded that this is the law for taking their money. So we, um, we're very careful about that and we um, take, take notes on them all the time. And in our new performance standards, they've asked that we do, we've always had school board training, 
but it was I usually did it when we had new school board members. It now will be annually, and this is my second time in front of you to do the annual Head Start training. I have given you a packet to make it a little easier to follow along. And you'll have the first one you have has actual highlight on it. If you want to open up your packet and find the um, first document that has highlight. So what I did with this document is I made it in 2016, which um, we have to um, talk about what the responsibilities are of the governing bodies. In Head Start, in performance standards, you are, re you are called the governing body. We refer to you as the school board. I did, I have in the first paragraph that I paraphrased from the performance standards and the Head Start Act from December of 2007 to reflect the relevant standards. These standards are written for programs all over the country and school division grantees look a little different than perhaps the YMCA or Department of Social Services that might have a grant. So it does, it is a little different. So instead of writing everything on this document that I have for us, I paraphrased it. So I have um, on program governance and the 1301s are in the performance standards, it's the numbers that have um, the program operations. So program governance, and the next part that you see that's highlighted is that the grantee, um, which is the school division, we must establish and maintain a formal structure for program governance that includes a governing body, a policy council, and a parent committee. Governing bodies have a legal and fiscal responsibility to administer and oversee the grantee's Head Start program. Policy council is responsible for the direction of the Head Start program. So in everything that I tell you this evening, the most important words that the government wants you to know as the governing body, as a school board, is that you are the legal and fiscal responsibility to administer the Head Start program. So the rest of the document kind of tells how you do that and how we share information among each other. The composition of a governing body, because we are a school board and you are elected, we do not have to fulfill, we're sort of exempt from all of the things that they have us in the act, the act spells out all the different types of people that we have to have on the board, but because we're elected, um, we are taken care of on that. And actually, we do really well as far as what they ask for, um, a financial person, um, education person, uh, lawyers, things like that. So we do really well with the elected school board and also the accompanying people that help us. On page two, this is directly from anything that is in the bold is directly from the standards. So the governing body, body shall, and I'm just going to read you the, the first part there, um, the legal and fiscal responsibility, as I mentioned, that's what they always want you to know, adopt practices that assure active, independent, and informed governance, fully participate in the development, planning, and evaluation of Head Start, and be responsible for ensuring compliance with federal laws and regulations and state and local laws. That is um, your duties and responsibilities. And then you are responsible for these, all of those other activities there. If you wanna just take a moment and glance over them, I'm not going to read them all to you. You will recognize some of the things in there as the things that I present to you monthly in the information items. The Head Start grant that you approve every year has a lot of those items in there. And then occasionally you will get, as you got this document at one point in time, and some of the other documents in the packet will be familiar to you as well. So when I need something that, you, that I need you to review, it comes into the school board information or it comes to be approved. On page three, I just wanted to bring to your attention that we are supposed to have advisory committees, especially health, um, but they can be established by the school board when they are deemed necessary. So at this point, um, you have not deemed any committees necessary to me, to Head Start. However, we are very an active member of the SHAB, Spotsylvania Health Advisory Board, and we also are very active in the Virginia Head Start Health Advisory Committee. So I, I believe that our program is um, up to date on all of the health things that we need to learn about through those two organizations. So we don't have a separate health advisory. I'm comfortable with the two entities that we are involved with. The next several pages are about policy council and policy committee. I didn't, um, 
I didn't highlight any of that. This is free for you to read when you would like. Again, I'm going to just say that Policy Council in our organization looks, a, it, it operates a little differently than perhaps um, a YMCA because they actually would have to make policy and that's the name of the, of the group, a policy committee, policy council. It also has a policy committee which is also known as a parent committee which meets at the classroom level. So in, an, in a program that is not a um, school board, a school division, you would have parents at the classroom level coming up with policy or ideas or things that they would like to, to change or do or put into place then they would take that to policy council and then policy council would they take that to the governing body. Now what I love about a school division grantee is that um, we have all these policies in place. I know that they've been read and vetted and I know that they're legal and that makes me feel really, really comfortable and I really like that about being a school division and grantee. And any time, um, like if you ever look in any of my books, you're going to see school board policy, J, school board policy. At, as soon as I see something in here, I try to make sure that I can relate it to the school board policy because I really believe that that's a better way to make policy um, rather than parents. Um, we have had on occasion um, when parents will come from another program and um, mostly what they, they want things like um, oh, we, want it, we want our kids to um, ride a different bus home. You know, we only have the Head Start dedicated buses or we want our kids to, um, it's mostly we, something that they want their children to do that we know for health and safety is not always the best appropriate thing. So we just have the conversations with the parents about why we um, have the, the rules that we have and we haven't had any concerns. But I really, really like being a school division grantee. I, I love having those policies that when a Fred reviewer asks me about procurement, I just get out the school board docs and I say, here's our procur procurement. If they ask me about um, the safety of the buildings, the crisis response plans, I say, this is what we have in the building. So it really makes it, um, I really like that a lot. And it's very helpful and I think it's just really has a lot of integrity. So those are the um, what on page three and four are what policy council and parent committee do. On page five, the highlight is the training, which is what we're doing today. And um, I am going to, um, we do have to do specifically the training on eligibility, which I will go over in just a moment. But the highlight on 1301.5 is that our training that you're receiving this evening. 1301.6 is impasse. This is something that you also get on in the information. You have it in your packet. And it is um, it's towards the back of your packet. We have to have a written policy. If the policy council and the school board did not agree on something, which in our case, it, it we don't really have that concern um, because we have school board, a school board. And so um, we usually just explain to them what the school board policies are. So we have never had to use that. However, we do have to have that in writing and you do have that in your packet. On page six, Head Start Act in December of 2007 and all of those bold from A to I we, ha we have to supply to you. So I know um, many times I have the question, especially from new school board members, as to why we would be giving you the credit card receipts for only the Head Start program in this entire school division. And that is why, because according to the performance standards, we have to show the governing body what we're, what we're using our credit card for. So you get those monthly. You also get the program monthly report, and that's going to tell you all of these other things in here, like how many meals that we served, through USDA, our program enrollment reports, um, a little bit about what the program is accomplishing, and um, the program information reports, which are something that you also get in August, because that goes to Congress. And anything that we get from, I get things all the time from the Office of Head Start. Um, 
and you, you get those also. <laughs> and so um, I have to sort of sift through those. Um, a information memorandum, I do not have to necessarily share with all the school board members. A program instruction, I have to share with all school board members. So every once in a while, you'll have an ACF, um, um, Administration for Children and Families, with some numbers behind it, and that is a program instruction that all governing body have to see, and I will include that on the monthly packet. Sometimes it relates to our program, and sometimes it does not. I do show all of that to Policy Council as well. So the next two um, paragraphs underneath that bold is just telling um, you how you get that information, which is through the monthly information items that are on the school board packet that come to you. And on page seven, you are, governing body is to be a part of the planning, which is all the planning is included in the refunding application. So all of those bullets all of those were included just last month at the April 9th school board meeting, actually this month. Um, when you approve this, the, the um, Head Start refunding application, all of those items were inclusive in that document that you got. And that is an abbreviated version. Next year is a five-year grant renewal and it'll be much larger. Any questions on that before we move to um, the, the eligibility training? We need a grant in order to operate the Head Start. That's correct. And do yes. we make a dollar grant every year or do we just look at the number of potential enrollees and base our grant application on the number of available or expected enrollees? The grant was given, given to us in 2008 as a relinquishment grant from the City of Fredericksburg. It was given to us with 121 slots for children. And then over the year, I was able to bring in one more child, which they called to tell me that I, um, that I well, what was the words that they told me? That I added to our enrollment without permission. <laughs> one child because the funding is for 121. So I had to write a narrative that we ran through Policy Council so that we could pick up that one extra child because the way that we had the classrooms, we could put another child in. So they told me that I had expanded, that was it. You did expansion without the money. So the only way you can actually do expansion is if there are grants available and out there and they send out um, information that there are grants available. We did get word that there's going to be grants available um, for expansion of early Head Start, which we do not have. They're going to have expansion for the um, early, the child partnerships that you partner with a private daycare. And they're going to have um, grants for duration, which we already applied for um, two years ago and received, and that increased our grant. And then we do get COLA grants in, um, every once in a while. But we do not, uh, we haven't had expansion for Head Start, existing Head Start programs, we have not had. So we have about a, 150, did I understand? We have 122 children. 122. How many children live in Spotsylvania in, in our school division that are potential Head Start, who need Head Start? We got 120. So, about and then we'll ha um, Virginia Preschool Initiative serves 139 children. So we are serving 261 okay. children. How many children are there to, that should be served? Well, um, if you want to, we can. I can give you the wait list numbers. As far as knowing who's out there, the um, the state has a has a formula, and I think they have. They, we have about 300 that the state says that we have using their formula um, on our using our. Um, applications that we have in-house right now. Uh, we have 93 applications on the wait list right now. However, uh, uh, 23 of those 93 are actually income eligible for a Head Start program, which is the poverty level. Mm -hmm. So 23, if we had a Head Start class, would go right into Head Start, depending on location, too, as well, the way that... Uh, I, I so guess what then, So some of the then an additional 51 of those would be eligible for yeah. Virginia Preschool Initiative. I guess what I'm asking is, as, as you look at our population, mm -hmm. if they could all qualify for, and we had the space, how many 
should we be serving? How many kids in our community? We, we have, what, about 1,800 kids annually start kindergarten? I don't have that number for you. I would, I would, I would think that the state's um, formula for deciding that is pretty close to what, what we would have, which is about 350, 360. I'm not, I'm not quite sure of that number. Um, so that's the total number of children that are in need of Head Start in Spotsylvania. Yeah, that is for VPI, because the VPI families can make almost double the income of a Head Start family, which is why we, have our, we keep our wait list broken up according to income. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, Thank you. Carol, if you want to look up the VDOE and VPI, they'll have that number there. It's, I think it's over but three, it's either 361 or 391. I'm sorry that I didn't bring that number. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as me knowing in the community how many children are really out there, I don't have that information. Yeah. No, I was looking for an estimate, that's all. Yeah. That's, the estimate that's from fine. VPI, I'm, I'm yeah. really, I should have brought that number. That's, that's, that's fine. About that, that's okay. adequate. So we're serving um, 261. Any other questions before we move to eligibility? So you have to be trained on eligibility as a governing body. However, I really was very careful in what I read because training on eligibility is about a half a day. <laughs> so it looks like the bottom line is I would like for you to take a look at, and you do, you do receive this um, usually around February. If you would look in your packet, it should be the second document. Um, the, it's the application. This does come through for you. You don't have to approve this, but you do have to review it, and it was sent to you either January or February. And that is what we ask the families for. Uh, it is a Head Start performance standard that we take this information in person. So even if we put this online, we still have to see these families in person. Um, do you sometimes have to help families to fill out the application as well? All the time. Okay. We have the application totally in Spanish, and we have to help the, the Hispanic families as well. Um, yes, we, we, we help them a lot. Mm -hmm. But we are careful in our program, and Mr. Braswell knows this because he's been with us for a while. We're very careful to just support and help our families. But we try very, we, we still want them to be responsible and to learn how to do these pieces so that when they move on to public, to the kindergarten, um, that they're not relying on us to, to help them apply for kindergarten and get all their documents. We certainly say, here's your documents, put them in, this, in, a, in a folder and don't lose them because you're going to need them when you register for kindergarten. So we, we, we support them a lot, but we, um, we still want them to learn responsibility as well because we can get their birth certificates and we can get photo IDs and we can go online and see who paid their taxes on their residence and we can do a lot of that and we do a lot of that for them, but we also ask them to do the first part as well. The next part of in your packet is the is this salmon color, orange color. I would like for you to take a look at it. That is really what we're, what we're really going to focus on for your eligibility training. This document, as you will first see, it does not have the child's name on it. So we have an application number. We have um, just the date of birth. And then we have the, that one box. It tells us if they're categorically eligible, which be foster children. Um, children receiving um, temporary assistance for needy families. Then we have if they are income eligible for Head Start, they're income eligible for VPI, and if they're over, then we would write what they're over by. We put a dollar amount in there of what they are over. And then we have on the, on the right side, it tells us exactly where they are. Now, the reason that we break this up so much is because VPI can accept families at or below 200% of the federal poverty guideline. Head Start is at 100%. Then we break them up into 101 to 130, and then as you can see those. So what we do this for is if we have the wait list for Head Start, we take all the poverty level families.
for VPI. We then try to fill in with the families. Still, if we have, um, if we had them at the 100%, we put them in VPI as well. So, and then we start to do incrementally. When the VPI classes haven't filled, then we'll go into the 101 to 130, and then we'll go into the 131 to 200, and then we'll, if we have to go above 200 for children that might have an um, IEP. So we still put the families in incrementally, trying to find the neediest families and trying to make sure that we serve the neediest families. We're very thorough on this because we're always looking for the authentic story of the family. And we probably ask more questions than the government wants us to, but we're really trying to, to really reach the people that really need the program. Then from there, you can see we have points attached to um, risk factors. The risk factors come from a community needs assessment. They come from different types of research. They come from um, talking to, hearing from families. We also talk to our family service workers. Usually once a year, we say, what are you hearing in the families? And of course, you know, right now we're hearing about the drug, the opioid, hearing that. We're also hearing um, but from, um, we now have children that are being just dropped off and they're not even grandparents or aunts and uncles. So we're having, we're watching this and we're having a little bit of an increase and in they're just being raised by family, by friends. So we need to, that's something that we, it's come to our attention, so we will watch that and um, probably put that in as a risk factor as that goes up. Um, of course, incarcerated parent has been there for a while. Teen parent at the time of the Head Start or Child's birth. Um, so we look at this every year. Policy Council, Mr. Brazel has been some, we've had some interesting discussions on some of these um, when the parents talked to us about that. Uh, military deployed uh, came from the VPI guidelines. So we put, because we are single point of entry. Military deployed in um, Tidewater area is, is a much larger risk factor because they're more enlisted. Here we seem to have not as many enlisted. Any questions on the selection criteria? Yes. I just had a question on the, it was still probably more in the numbers category, but the peer models for our VPI classes are not counted in the numbers. They they're, are. They're, they are yes. counted in the so, numbers. Um, okay. Um, Ms. Gramp is talking about, we have three um, early childhood special education inclusion classes. Um, we have three of them in the county and the makeup of them is um, to be a true inclusion class, it has to be 50% children with a disability and 50% um, typically developing. So they have six or seven children with, with IEPs and then we have four community models, which are, um, they just come from the general public and ECSE goes through those, through, I'm not sure if they have an application, but they select those children. And then three of those children are VPI children. And then we will, um, we, we actually handpick the VPI children that have not been selected because you know, if we're putting them into an inclusion class, we have to kind of really kind of feel that through and see if they're gonna be a good fit. So those children are included in the 139 that are served. Ms. Gramp, if I may add, we are looking into the possibility of um, looking at the reverse mainstreaming to see if there's a way of adding additional VPI students so that we would end up with additional um, funding for those children as well as the opportunity to have access to preschool. So that is something we're currently exploring. And I usually call those VPI parents and personally explain to them what it looks like and we have a really good um, I'm really proud to say that we haven't had anybody join and then not want to stay in the class so that's we feel good about that because you know you just have to explain that they're not going into the regular Head Start of EPI class but okay um, we did speak about impasse procedures already and then the last document is a management of program data. That was also something that came new in the performance standards that we had to tell the government what we're doing with all of our data. <laughs> 
And if you will just take a really brief look, you're going to see school board policy all over this document. <laughs> so this was, you know, exactly what I was saying, is I didn't have to make up procedures for Head Start and not just, you know, who am I to make these up, even though many, many directors make up these policies. I've worked very closely with Ms. Bowler. Um, we following the Library of Virginia schedule. And so this just makes me really happy that I have all this school board policy. And so when the Office of Head Start asks for this, um, so the only thing that's not on here, which will be on here shortly, is um, I needed to tell them what happens to the drum in a, in a printer copier that we have from RICO, because we're getting ready to get a new one. And so um, RICO has, or the new company said that they will actually, whoever takes our machine away, clears that drum and gives it to us. And then I don't know what I'm gonna do with it then, but. <laughs> so um, I will have that last piece of information that, um, that we needed on this, because copiers store all that information. Okay, so that's the, for privacy. Yes, yes. So I, I believe that there was an incident somewhere in the country where somebody took that drum in a Head Start program, and they actually were not supposed to take social security numbers, but they, they had them of children children's social security numbers and then they use they use that information I, I guess I'd like to find out you know how, how do we go about disposing of that or destroying that well, at some point. Uh, when I get it and we see what it looks like and then we can you know see what we need to do yeah, with I mean that to make yet. sure it's properly done right as well, absolutely you know? yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but right now I was just happy to know that the copier company was familiar with me asking for something like that <laughs> would that be something that could go with our like our and that record storage area disposal no. record. that disposal mr Braswell, i was going to say that the library of virginia uh, specifies certain types of approaches that you use to destroy information this would fall under that digital piece that has to be destroyed and um, what we would do is basically consult them and find out specifically how that information would be destroyed because it is different than it would be with heart type of things because even like on a hard drive or something like it or we call it the the digital vault where email and things like it go you can delete things off your computer but it doesn't disappear but there is a way that that can be done we just have to check with them first of all find out exactly what that is and find out how to properly destroy it. also yeah. the right time when it can be destroyed right right and I guess what we need to do is make sure she knows yeah yes. okay mm -hmm. oh yeah I work really closely with Ms. Bowler <laughs> anytime we have records and stuff so yes I just wanted to um, just comment briefly um, about VPI because um, I know the question does come about um, VPI is most of you know is state funded and it's also, um, now VPI, you do have the opportunity to um, gather up more children if you would like. You don't have to wait for um, the state to say that we're gonna give you money. So that money is accessible if you can do the, the match from a school board. So there's other, and, and space and things like that. But for Head Start, um, we stay where we are until they actually put money out there. But we were really pleased to have the duration grant um, which was really nice and they actually made an exception for us because I said we're not going to only let 40% of our children come for the extra 20 days. We're, we're not going to do that as a program. And so they let me apply for 100%, which was not what we were supposed to. And then the other thing I think most of you know about that I was very excited about was we were able, there was money last year um, that was just out there that was left over and we, had, we were able to uh, request two school buses and they're here, and um, I've seen them at the transportation lot. So um, that was exciting. That was the first time that, we, that money was available to actually get out there and get two school buses. And that's the end of your yeah. annual Head Start training, if there's yeah. any other questions. Yeah, I have a, a couple. How do you uh, advertise for people? How do you find the potential enrollees who may not know anything about it, probably are illiterate in many cases, and uh, so Our biggest on. source of, of advertising is with the Department of Social Services and the Health Department. So we have our applications there. Um, we have them, you know, hard copy where parents can pick them up. And um, we work really closely with the Department of Social Services. And so we refer families back and forth all the time. We put, um, we have it on the website. Um, we have it um, in the libraries. 
And um, you can't really, there's places now that you can't really leave things like you used to be yeah. able to, you know, like at Food Lion. <laughs> um, but the word does get out. We take about 400 applications. Um, we, we put some on Rover when, um, I think when Rover went out somewhere, we've given them some. And um, we take them to um, any kind of event, you know, we'll have them. Um, we have them, up. if the schools have an event, they, all the schools have them too. And we take a lot of phone calls. The word does seem to get out um, about, and our new location is, is really good. People know where we are, and Department of Social Services sends them to us. I would say our biggest referral source is the Department of Social Services, because we're working with the same families. Mm -hmm. I, I would just like, I just have a comment, because um, I go to, pretty much all the policy council meetings and I'm a, he does, I'm I have a lot of, I already asked my questions. <laughs> so I just wanted to just commend you for all the work that you do with Head Start. Uh, for those that don't know, uh, you're very passionate about uh, your calling as director of Head Start and you do an excellent job. And I want to say that for everyone to hear it because I actually believe that it's true. I am thankful that uh, for the past five years as I've been on this board uh, that I've had an opportunity to work with you and work very closely with you. I've learned a lot from you. And so I tell my other board members that for the last three years of my term, I will continue to be on the Head Start uh, committee and I'm not leaving. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much for the work that you do, uh, especially for the children that we serve. And I am very confident that our children are getting the very best because of your passion for what you do. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, there's a lot of support from the school board. I always hear that. I always hear early childhood. Thankful for that as well. I want to say thanks to Dawn also because when I first came on the school board, uh, the first two years I worked with Dawn on Head Start and then Barron followed me. It's an eye opener to be able to see all the services that Head Start provides. It's a shame that there isn't, there aren't sufficient funds out there to be able to provide the same level of services in terms of wraparound services that we do for Head Start, and truly they deserve that. But that same kind of wraparound services is what we truly need for the other levels, where VPI and, and so forth, uh, be able to connect with the parents and the importance of the and how the importance that the parents have in the education of their children is so emphasized in Head Start that it is one of the predominant factors that makes for the success of that program. And I commend Dawn and her staff because it was an eye opener for me, you know, in the first two years when I was on the board. And I'm glad that Barron has been able to pick up on that passion for that because it is truly once you've been through it, you do become passionate about it. And thank you, Dawn, for carrying that forward. Thank you. I do want to add that we have a, a, a staff member um, that is a VPI registrar, and she also does ESOL. And she's been able to, and she, um, she's been able to do a little bit with the families. So we've been able to reach out to her when we have some. So we have a little bit happening. Um, the McKinney Vinto grant. There's a three-year grant um, with a. Um, and they have a three-year person that we're working with, too. And so she's been able to reach out to the VPI parents specifically as well. So she and I have been really working together, too, to coordinate services so that we don't want to duplicate on the Head Start side. We want to make sure that what she can provide, we give that to um, VPI. Mr. Blaine. I understand that to have a VPI student, you need funds for that in the school division you have to have housing and the teachers and so on but if, if and you indicated that you could come to the school board and uh, request additional VPI students if with some sort of funding from them what how much do you figure it would cost for us to approve one student I mean if you can if you came and said look I have one student I need a thousand dollars for the year for this one student or whatever I'm, I'm, I this is all just estimate from my head, yeah, but I believe that the county, the, the state says, the state says you get $6,000 per child, but that's not the cash. That's 
when you put in your match, it becomes 6,000. It's a little bit, when I was first hearing, it's like, oh, 6,000 per child, but, but really it's not. It's 6,000 per child when the county puts in their match. So I think it might be 4,000 and then 2,000, it's 25%, but, that's, but then there's a different way that you can get that match. The Head Start match, we can do just services. VPI match has to be cash. Mm -hmm. But um, I know Mr. Treyer has that number exactly. Like Mr. Treyer would, could tell you exactly for one VPI child what the state gives us and then what the county has to put in. The reason I have this interest is just I'm going for the, with the young kids mm -hmm. because uh, elementary principals, a number have told me probably half the principals say half of their children coming to enroll for kindergarten never have a book, have had a book in their hand. Mm -hmm. And these kids are two years behind starting off. Mm -hmm. And so my problem is how do we find who these young people are and who quality got? We have two programs if they're economically qualified and mm -hmm. other things. So that's, that's my concern or interest, I should say. What, what, what can we do aggressively to see if we can expand our educational opportunities for these young people that especially need them? I think that you know, the Rover, I think, is going to be a great help when they're out in the neighborhoods because we're putting books in children's hands, mm -hmm. the first thing. And then, you know, parents get on the bus and she's got resources for them to see as well. And then just the um, having the applications there too, you know, especially if, if, if they target certain areas mm -hmm. um, in the county. I think the, the, the families that we, that I know we're reaching, you know, most of the families that, because they know where we are, but personally, um, I believe that there's more families out in Berkeley and Livingston that are, don't always apply. And I don't know if it's just their proximity to the schools or they have family members. There's no daycares out there, but they have, you know, the families out there have relatives. There's a lot of relatives and things. So sometimes I think they have family care and they might not be applying for the program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for the training. We have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion by Mr. Blaine, second by Ms. Shelley. All those in favor? Aye. Aye.